Well, good morning. Good to see you this morning. Last week, we ended with a compilation of the scriptures that have to do with the crucifixion of Jesus. If you don't have the notes from last week, go online and get them. Because I dare say, and let me ask this question as we begin. How many of you have ever read a compilation of the account of the crucifixion where all the gospels are together and are read, you know, as if it's one story rather than four different accounts? Just a couple of you. And so to get the full impact as much as we can get it in writing, go ahead and get those notes if you don't already have them and keep them. And from time to time, take three or four or five minutes and read what happens at the cross. And as you do that, do it this way as you should and as we should every time we open the Word of God. The purpose of the Word of God, the reason why we have been given the Word of God is not just to have a volume about God, but it is God's purpose and means that when we read the Word of God, we come into communion with the God of the Word. So why read the Word? Why study the Word? Why memorize the Word? Why be understanding of the Word? Because it's only through the Word as applied by the Holy Spirit. Only through the Word as applied by the Holy Spirit. May I repeat that? Only through the Word as applied by the Holy Spirit will we know the God of the Word. Amen? That's the significance of the Word of God. So this morning, what we're going to do is pick up from last week the crucifixion. And last week, you remember, we quoted from Acts 2, 23, that Jesus' death, according to the apostle Peter, who has been given revelation by the Holy Spirit, here is a man who steps out about nine o'clock in the morning and preaches to the people assembled when they hear all these strange things. And they say, what's going on? You people drunk or something? Y'all crazy? What's going on? He said, that's not what's happening. He said, this is in fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. You remember that? And so Peter begins to preach and Holy Spirit gives him a sermon that is, if you would, unprepared as far as sitting down and reading and making notes and putting an outline together. The Holy Spirit is literally flowing through this man as this man speaks. It is the word of the Holy Spirit speaking through Peter's speech and Peter's way of communicating and with Peter's accent. And what does the Holy Spirit say? That the death of Jesus, remember in Acts 2.23, is the pre or was the predetermined and foreknowledge of God. That what we have seen in the death of this man was the outworking of God's eternal plan. This was no accident. This was God's plan. And so this morning, I want to emphasize the scriptural evidence and the substance of that. Because I think that what often happens is that we read these things and yet we don't tie it to scripture clearly enough. And so here's what I did last week, or actually in the middle of the week as I was preparing for last week. And I'll let you know that because I only tell you that hopefully so we can be encouraged together. I said, Lord, what's the next class? What, how, where do I go from here, Donnie? I know that last week is to read the crucifixion. And typically so, once you read the crucifixion, what's the next step? Read the what? The resurrection. I mean, Todd, that makes sense, doesn't it? Anton, that makes sense. Chris, that makes sense. Johnny, that makes sense. 
That's what you do. What we have to be careful of as believers is to not assume what is next. Because it was not next in God's economy for this class this time. So I said, because I've learned, if I've not learned a lot, but I've learned a couple of little things. And one of the things I have and continue to learn and grow in is ask God. James 4.2, you have not because you ain't asked. You have not because you ask not. And I can't teach a class without knowing from the Holy Spirit, Adam, what I'm going to say. I can't do that, Mike. Well, no, I can do it, but I'm not going to do it. So, Kenneth, what I did is said, ask God, what's next? Nothing came to me, Belinda, nothing. Then about a day or two later, there's the answer. You see, I had to relax and trust the Holy Spirit for the answer when I didn't get an answer. I had to trust him for an answer when I didn't get an answer. The answer was already on the way when I asked, even before I asked, but I didn't receive it until he was ready to give it to me. Can you learn from that? Can we learn from that? And here's what I received, Daniel. Assemble some of the scriptures that have to do with showing that the Old Testament prophesies what happens at the cross. Oh, okay. I can do that. I will do that. Again, why do I share that with you? Only to encourage us that as believers in Jesus Christ, we have the life, the mind, the attitude, the desires, the purpose, everything about God in us by the Spirit. And we are no longer to be making independent, unilateral decisions. We are to do everything according to the leading of the Spirit by asking and hearing and receiving and then doing. Amen? Everything. Now, what I'm going to do, too, I did not get everything from the Lord on the day that this was put together, and Evan had the notes, and so Saturday, I'm getting more. Hmm. So I have to add things to your notes. So I'm going to tell you, this area is not in your notes, and so you may have to take different kinds of notes on that, all right? So when Jesus goes to the cross... Jesus knows that every aspect of his life was prophesied in the Old Testament. Remember what he said in John, this is not in your notes, in John 5, 39. And you can just write down the scripture if you want to. What am I saying? Jesus knows, not only at the cross, but in Gethsemane and every other place, but we're talking about the cross. He knows that every aspect of his life has already been predetermined as prophes and prophesied in the Old Testament. It was predetermined. You see, the word predestination, hated by so many, is loved when it comes to the life of Jesus, but it is only loved by, in the life of Jesus, and folks don't like it in our lives because they don't like something being predetermined. But what happened in Christ and what was true of Christ is true, true of those who are in Christ. It's not different for us who are in Christ. John 5, 39. Jesus knows this. Listen, he tells the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you will have eternal life. But it is they that bear witness of me. What scriptures is he talking about? Old Testament scriptures. Luke twenty two forty four. 44. Remember the two people coming back from Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus and they're all cast down because Jesus has died and he's speaking to them and he breaks bread with them. And then he says, everything. How much? Everything written about me in the law of Moses, which is the Pentateuch specifically, and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So, in Luke 9, 22, 
I think this is in your notes. G Jesus tells his disciples, you remember, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the chief priests and scribes and be killed. You remember that? He knows it. How does he know it? How does he know it? Come on, how does he know it? You can answer me. How does he know that? Billy, how does Jesus know he's going to suffer and be put to death and be killed? How does he know it? He knows the scriptures that prophesy it. He knows the Old Testament. How does Jesus know how to live? He knows the Word of God. How does he know where to go? He knows the Word of God. How does he know and understand what's happening? He knows the Word of God. All of it as applied and made real to him by the Holy Spirit. What does that say to us today? And too many in the church or too little in the very foundation and substance of their soul's life. And we need to be a whole lot more putting aside a whole lot of other things in preference for the reality and the truth of what life is all about. So this morning, let's take a look at some of these Old Testament prophecies that Jesus knew that gave him the confidence to embrace the cross as the Father's predetermined plan. Can you imagine facing the cross and not knowing what was happening? Why could he do this? Why could he lay his life down willingly? Why could he do this with joy? Remember Hebrews 12 too. Why could he do it with such confidence? Why? Because he knows the word. How can we live life with such confidence, such assurance, with such joy to the extent that we know and obey, believe the word of God. And to the place where we see lack of confidence and lack of joy and peace is the place that should say to us, I need more revelation of the Holy Spirit as to the word of God about the person and work and purpose of God himself in me. Correct? I didn't think I'd have much to say about this, but if I don't get to, I thought we'd skip through this today and I'd be finished in 10 minutes. I suppose that's not going to happen. So let's start off where everything begins in the book of Genesis 3.15. The Lord is cursing, remember? And he comes to 3.15 and he curses the serpent. Now, within the context of this curse is every single prophecy about the suffering and death of Christ. Within the context of this curse is every single prophecy. Do not see this curse, 315 of Genesis, as one of many, but see it as the umbrella of all the prophecies that have to do with the coming of Christ into the world, his suffering as a human being, the divine one living in a man, submitting to humanity, uh, to the issues of humanity, and then going to the cross and dying and being buried. See, all of that where? Within the context of this verse. Again, see the word as great and grand, not just bits and pieces. This is great and grand. So when we read this word, and God gives this word in Genesis, he is saying that the rest of the Bible is contained and will flow from this word. Isn't it amazing? Isn't this word of God incredible? And here's what he says. Yahweh is speaking. Now, who is the word of God? Christ is the word of God. Remember, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and words with, remember the word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And you remember that? And then 14, verse 14 of John 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten son, full of grace, truth and grace. Remember that? We're talking about Christ. So this is the pre-incarnate Christ speaking to Satan. Speaking to Satan. You see, oh, how can I do this and not, we got to go, go 10 hours here. This is why, this is why, this is why when Satan tempts Jesus 
in the wilderness in Matthew 4 or in Luke 4. He knew whom he was tempting because he was the one who was being cursed in Genesis 3.15, don't you see? And he knew that if he could undo that one who has now become a huma in humanity, he can undo the curse and he will reign forever on the earth, ruling as the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He knows. Put it together. Put the whole word together. Have a content of comprehensive understanding and flow of the word of God. Do you see it? Do you see it? May I ask you that? Can you tell me yes or no? Do you see this? So see Matthew 4 and Luke 4 in the wilderness that that serpent knows this verse is about him and he knows that that man is the one who has come to crush him on the head. He knows that. You see, we don't put it together. That's why Satan is so vehemently attacking and viciously Take an opportunity against the Son of Man after 40 days of the weakness of the flesh as to know, you know, as to his uh, fasting. That's what's happening. Satan is trying to get the Son of Man to fail as to God's purpose. So here's what he says. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed or offspring and her offspring. Remember the seed is Christ, Gen uh, Galatians 3.16. And he, who? The seed of the woman, Christ, shall bruise you as to your head. In other words, he's going to stomp your head and you shall bruise him as to his heel. You shall wound him on the heel, the foot, the crucifixion. In this promise is gathered all the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah and his ministry, and it culminates in his death and burial and resurrection. You got it? Do we have that? Are we together on this together? Okay. I don't want to go too fast. I'm going to go through these scriptures and not comment too much about them. I just want them to sink in, to sink in. And I will let you know which ones I do not have in your notes. So let's just listen to what Jesus knew before going to the cross. Let's listen to it. And let's begin to get a deeper understanding and flavor and significance of the word of God, not only in the life of Jesus, but the necessity of it in our own lives, in our own lives. So Jesus knew Isaiah 53, 8. By oppression and judgment, he is the Messiah. He is the one, the suffering servant. He was taken away. He knew he would be taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living. Cut off means what? Killed. Killed. He knew that. Stricken for the oppression, transgression of my people. He knew he'd be killed. Matthew 27, 1 to 2, very early in the morning, the leaders, the leading priests and other leaders met again to discuss how to persuade the Roman government to sentence Jesus to death. And then they bound him and took him to Pilate to the Roman governor. He knew Isaiah 53, 7, the beginning of that verse. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he did not open his mouth to say a word. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. In other words, he didn't defend himself. From prison and trial, they led him away to death. Matthew 27, 12 to 14. But when the leader, leading priests and other leaders made their accusations against him, Jesus remained silent. Don't you hear the many charges against you, Pilate demanded? But Jesus said nothing much to the governor's surprise. Jesus knew Micah 5.1. With a rod, they will strike the leader of Israel in the face. He knew Isaiah 50, verse 6. I, gave, I give my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pull up my beard. I do not hide from shame, for they mock me and spit in my face. These prophecies are written hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Fulfillment, Matthew 26, 67 to 68. Are oh, you with me? Am I going... Okay, okay. <clears throat> then they spit in Jesus' face and hit him with their fists. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Messiah. Who hit you in that time? 
Who did it? Matthew 27, 30. And they spit on him and grabbed the stick and beat him on the head with it. Prophecy. Psalm 22, 14 to 16. My life is poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. They have pierced my hands and my feet. Prophecy. Jesus knew Zechariah 12, 10a. A means the first part of the verse. They will look on me whom they have pierced and mourn for him as for an only son. Fulfillment. Matthew 27, 31. And when they were finally tired of mocking him, they took him, took off the robe and put on his own clothes and they led him away to be crucified. The piercing, the piercing. Jesus knew Isaiah 53, 3. He, remember, Yahweh, the servant of God, the Messiah, who was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Fulfillment, John 1, 11. He was in the world, and, through the, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him, and he came into his own, and his own did not receive him. They rejected him. Prophecy. Jesus knew Psalm twenty two fifteen. He says, my strength is dried up like a potshead, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Fulfillment. Matthew 27, 48. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge and he filled it with vinegar, put it on a stick and they offered it to Jesus to drink. Jesus knew Psalm 22, verses 17 to 18. He knew the whole Psalm, but we're specifying these parts of it. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. <clears throat> John 19, 23, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven into one piece from top to bottom. You see, Jesus knew Psalm 22, 7 through 8. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads, saying, is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let, him, then let the Lord save him. And if the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Fulfillment, Matthew 27, 39 to 40. And the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. So, you can destroy the temple and build it again in three days, can you? Well, then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. Jesus knew Psalm 22, 1 to 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry out day by day, but you do not answer by night and am not silent. Fulfillment, Matthew 27, 46, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabanathai, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus also knew Psalm twenty-two, thirty-one. This is the last verse of that psalm. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Fulfillment, John nineteen thirty. Then Jesus had received the sour wine. He said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus knew Numbers 9, 12. They must not leave any of the lamb. This is talking about the Passover lamb. Until the next morning. And they must not break any of its bones. They must follow all the normal regulations concerning the Passover. John, the fulfillment, John 19, 31 to 37. So the soldiers came and broke the bones, the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. So they did not break his bones, his legs. Jesus also knew John 19, 31 to 37. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. I'm sorry, this is a fulfillment. I'm reading the same one, am I not? Okay, I have some duplication here. 
That's all right. It's good to read the word twice. Jesus knew Isaiah 53.10, but it was the Lord's good plan or pleasure to crush him and to fill him with grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, or after his life is made an offering for sin, he will have a multitude of children, many heirs. Fulfillment, Romans 5.19. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so that by the one man's disobedience the many will be made righteous. Acts 2.41. On the day of Pentecost, about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Revelation 19.1. A great multitude in heaven. You see the fulfillments. Jesus also knew Isaiah 53, 9. He had done no wrong and he had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. The fulfillment, Matthew 27, 57 to 60. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea, who was one of Jesus' followers, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long linen, long linen cloth. He placed it in his own tomb, which, he had been, which had been carved out of the rock. Now, knowing these scriptures allowed Jesus to embrace the Father's will. Now, we said a lot before some of you came in a little late from the next door, so... Let me encourage you just to get the first part of what we said this morning. Knowing these scriptures, Jesus went to the cross knowing what? This is God's will. But how could Jesus do it with such confidence and joy? You see, Jesus is not filled with joy and confidence and peace, the peace of God, the joy of God the Father, in going to the cross just to go to the cross. Jesus is filled with joy and peace, God's joy and God's peace and confidence in the will of the Father that he is doing the will of the Father. Because when he goes to the cross, he knows the prophecies that say and the promises that say you will go to the cross. But he also knows the rest of the prophecies that have to do with his resurrection from the dead. And so you'd, it has to be both put together because if Jesus did not know that God had promised to raise him from the dead, could he have gone to the cross with confidence and joy? I don't know. But God gave him the confidence to know that when he dies, God the Father will raise him up again. That's all I can tell you. And because of that, Jesus goes to the cross so that the entire experience, the most excruciating, horrible, and terrifying experience that anyone could ever experience is done so with hope. Amen? Hope. You see, in Genesis 3.15, which we talked about before some of you came in, Everything about the life, ministry, death, burial, and resurrection is contained in that verse. And this is the outworking of it. And Jesus went to the cross with hope. Why? Here's what he says. We've already quoted this, but we quote the rest of it. We quoted it in the beginning. Luke 9, 22, Jesus says to his disciples, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. I stopped there. Did you notice I stopped there? What? And look what he says. And. Is and in bold letters in your notes? And what? And what? And I ain't staying in the grave. I'm rising. You see, it's the 
power and the promise of the resurrection that gave Jesus the great impetus and hope and assurance that everything about his life would succeed as to God's purpose, right? Everything. About the resurrection, it's all getting to one place, the resurrection. That's what kept Jesus going. Resurrection, 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 resurrection. What keeps us going? If the Democrats get in, if the Republicans get in, if we don't get any new taxes, if it doesn't get too hot this summer, what keeps us going? What is the foundation and basis and quintessential proof of the genuineness and truthfulness and validity of our faith? It is the resurrection. And we have that given to us in a reality because we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Are you with me on this? <clears throat> this is not in your notes, so you may have to take it down. <clears throat> Remember the cry of dereliction on the cross? My God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? For the first time in all eternity, the Son of the Father's love, the beloved Son of the Father, the eternal Son of God, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, experiences in the incarnation, in the humanity of Jesus, in the humanity of Jesus, he experiences for the first time what it is to become God's enemy. My God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? He experiences the climax of the wrath of God against himself because he is our sin bearer. Now, let me say this. He bears and carries our sin to the cross. Let me make sure you hear this clearly. Jesus Christ does not in any way personally experience being a sinner. I've heard preachers say Jesus all of a sudden <clears throat> understood what it is to think filthy thoughts. To be That is a lie. He does not become permeated or what word do I want to say? Uh, the, the, the sin doesn't enter his, uh, his, his nature as a functioning thing. It remains on him as he carries the payment for our sin without experiencing the pollution of our sin. This man does not experience in himself to do the polluting acts of sin. He experiences what it is to be polluted by sin. You know, you can mm, sit in the pig poop and experience the pollution, but you don't have to eat it. Can you say amen? amen? Jesus does not eat it. There's some people who say he ate it. You've heard it. Jesus experienced every filthy thought. He experienced it judicially, yes. But he didn't eat it. And it wasn't his personally. He was the bearer of sin. I've forgotten where we were going on that. He was, tempted, he, he was tempted to sin, but he didn't eat it. The pig poop came against him, but it didn't enter him. Now, the cry of dereliction, oh yes, being deserted, if you would. The Holy Spirit some way withdraws the affection and the experience of the affection and fellowship of the Father from Jesus. Now, when he says that, 
it seems that he may have lost faith and hope. But the opposite is true. Because you see, when Jesus quotes Psalm 22, verse 1, which begins how? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He does it within the context of knowing the entire psalm. And then he does this by embracing the prophecies about the resurrection. Knowing the prophecies about his resurrection gave Jesus the confidence and joy. So, for instance, you don't have this in your notes. He embraces the cross knowing Psalm twenty two twenty one. Save me from the mouth of the lion. He cries out, save me. In other words, preserve me. Keep me. Protect me from being eaten by the lion, although I am in the jaws of the lion. And he also embraced the cross with God's answer to his prayer in verse 22. He says, save me in verse 21. In verse 22, he says this, I will tell of your name. Remember John 14, 9? Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He tells of God's name. He declares God's name. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You see, he gives praise for the answer to protect me from the lion's mouth, from being killed by the lion in a permanent way. He knows that he's coming back. This isn't in your notes. Yes, it is. He also knew Psalm foretold his resurrection, Psalm 1610. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your godly one to rot in the grave. Some verses say, seek corruption. You will not let your holy one, your anointed one, the Messiah, stay in the grave. Psalm 30, verse 3. You brought me up from the grave, O Lord. You kept me from falling into the pit of death. And so, knowing When he spoke the words of dereliction, Psalm 22, 1, when he spoke that, he spoke it as a covering, if you would, of everything in the psalm. As an introduction, if you would, and a summation of everything in the psalm, knowing that when he said, Psalm 22, verse 1, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He would also be saying, What's the last verse of Psalm 22? I just read it a moment ago. Say it again. What's the verse number? 31. And the last words of verse 31 of Psalm 22 is what? It's finished. And in John 19, 30, Jesus' last words before I commit myself to you is what? It is finished. He knows that he's going to the cross for the according to the Father's will to fulfill the Father's purpose. Remember, the cross, as everything in Jesus' life, is about God. It's for God. It's from God. I said this last week, I think. God is the subject. Jesus is the verb. And we are the object. All our preaching and teaching and sharing. Hmm. All of our preaching and teaching and sharing and counseling must be God-centered. It must ultimately be about God rather than ultimately being about ourselves. If we have to talk and share and teach and counsel concerning people's behavior, we must do that. But all of it has benefit and validity only because it is related to God. Amen? So everything we do and say and teach must wind up culminating in this. Did you see, experience, and know God better? 
in this sermon, in this teaching, in this counseling? Or did you know something about yourself and that's where it is? And so it is finished. So this week when I put this together, you know, led by the Holy Spirit, he said immediately, next week, and it's probably going to take us more than one, I have to warn you now, we're going to talk about what was finished. What was finished. Amen? So be praying about that. See you next week.